Good morning, everybody. I'm Kristen Fonatero from the University of Michigan, and welcome to this session of the 4T Virtual Conference. We're so excited to have you here today, and I'm particularly excited to be introducing Pete Benson from the Secondary Math Program at the um, University of Michigan School of Education, where he's a Woodrow Wilson Teaching Fellow. Um, today, Pete's topic is learning from scratch, which is the MIT um, programming tool. And I've seen Pete in action use this tool with kids, and I know that you have a lot to be excited about and to look forward to. So, Pete, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kristen. So, we, um, we happen to be in the same room, so we're getting some interesting uh, feedback here. So, learning from scratch. The, um, the Scratch environment is something with a, a long history, um, and it goes back to Seymour Papert at uh, the MIT, um, even the precursor to the Media Lab, uh, with the logo programming language back in the 60s. So you can see some, uh, uh, if you look at some of the things that I demonstrate, you'd be able to see a connection, for example, to logo. Um, and turtles, I'll give a demonstration on that uh, as I go through it. But uh, it's a platform that's just really flexible. Um, and they say on their site that it's for K to 14. Um, I use it uh, teaching my high school physics class, calculus class, algebra. Um, and it's, um, but I think it's also a really exciting tool for, uh, you know, even small kids. So. Um, it's a very simple environment to get started, but not really simplistic. It's amazing to me some of the features that you get access to that uh, you know, are difficult to do in other programming environments. So um, there's been a pretty radical change recently. They've gone to Scratch 2.0. I say radical, the kind of startling thing about it was that it seems like a fairly subtle change, except that all the development now uh, can, be, can take place in your browser. And yet it looks like the desktop application that I've been using for the previous six months. And this took place just a week ago. In fact, today happens to be um, kind of an online scratch convention. Uh, so if you go to the website, you'll probably see some references to that. But it's, everything's in the browser. All your projects are stored in the cloud. Um, and you can opt whether you want to share it or not. But anything you share is automatically wide open. Anybody can grab it and remix it. Um, the name Scratch actually refers to you know, scratching records, some of what a DJ does when he's uh, mixing songs together. And so that's really the, a key concept in Scratch. So who might use it? Um, I imagine it really could be used in virtually any academic setting. Um, great for uh, uh, creating art. I'll show you some things that I do with creating a storybook. Um, possible after school programs in the media center where maybe you've got a, uh, it could be a programming club or it could be working on something related to, uh, you know, other parts of the curriculum, a history class or a math class or uh, whatever. Um, so uh, just a quick check here. I wanted to see uh, what folks are doing here. So, okay, Kristen, you're going to have to remind me how to set this up for an A, a through E setting. So you can go to tools, Thank you. Eight. All right. And if you can click those um, letters, we'll see where folks are. So it looks like a lot of elementary. That's great. And I've got some, uh, some middle school applications here, as well as what, um, um, you know, just kind of across the spectrum. I'll show you most of what Scratch can do, actually, or most of the feature set. Um, I'm going to opt not to show much about uh, the sound features, because I just don't think it will come across well uh, playing sound through my speakers. Um, so I'll kind of skip over that. Okay, so what I'm going to show you, I'll give you a tutorial on the drawing editor, and I'm going to, this will be kind of a nonlinear presentation, despite the fact that I've got slides here. Um, you're going to see that uh, you know I kind of bounce between showing an application and showing you how you can build something that uh, works the way you just saw it in the application. Um, so here's the first example. So I'm going to do a uh, an application share, and you should see Scratch appear here on your screen. Okay. 
and I'm going to click on this one called the picnic. So at first I'll just give you a demo of this project. So I've gone to the Scratch site. I happen to be logged in, um, and so it shows me my projects. I can also browse or search. I could have searched for this by typing in um, P. Benson or typing in the picnic, and it would have found my, uh, my projects. So I'm going to um, just run this demo first. And so I'll hit the start. And now you notice a little dialogue popping up here. This actually is a new feature in Scratch 2.0, and it's asking for camera and microphone access from me. So I'm going to allow that. And so we'll show you one of these kind of uh, remarkable features of this app. So this happens to be an application that is um, all the graphics, the images you see, is, is from a children's book that uh, my mom wrote uh, back in the 50s. So here's the opening page, and it's a story about actually my siblings. This is before my time, so it's only my three older siblings. There's uh, my sister Chris begging for uh, mom to take her on a picnic. And there we are in our car driving to the picnic. And uh, so you see an animation here, and we'll talk about how you can do an animation. And, and then we arrive at the, uh, they're at the picnic, and there's a little dialogue going on here. Okay, and then we get to the next screen, and I'm not sure what you, if you can notice that there's a little bit of a shadow to it, maybe some motion in the background. That's actually me on the camera, and I'm moving with my hand. You can't see what I'm doing very precisely, but I'll show you more later. Um, but I'm causing that uh, butterfly to move around just by waving my hand in the air, and that's taking advantage of the built-in camera on the Mac. So it's a little bit like the Kinect. Um, so, and then there's the end of it. The uh, squirrel's happy. He's got his cracker. All right. So um, those are some of the features. Let's uh, kind of start going through how the Scratch environment works. I'm going to collapse this, and I'm just going to create a um, a new application. So I'm going to log in as myself. I hit uh, create, and I'll give it the same kind of name, but I'll call this uh, the Picnic uh, 4T 2013. Okay, every application starts out with a picture of Scratch the Cat. Scratch is a sprite. That means he can move around on the screen. In fact, we already see some uh, little building blocks over here. So this move 10 steps, for example, if I click on that, he'll move. And as I... Um, I'll go through and show you more about how we do the motion, but right now I'm going to start, I'll show you what what you can do to get started with uh, pulling in a picnic and creating a, creating an application. So in this case, we have sprites. The sprites move around on the stage, and the stage has backdrops. So I've selected backdrop right now, and these backdrops I could draw. Now, I don't really want to draw them. Um, they've already been... My mom did a better job than I can. So what I'm going to do is import these. You have some choices. There are backdrops I can choose from the library. So these are screens that, uh, backdrops that I could just use that are already built for me. I can draw a new one and use these drawing tools. Or I can pull one in from the disk. So I'll go to the picnic, go to my backdrops, and we'll start with the cover page. So that pulls in my cover page. Um, these other backdrops I don't need. So I'll get rid of it, and that's now my only page. And I'm going to pull in a couple more. Uh, I think they're in the, uh, uh, we've only got a subset here. They're in the car, and then they uh, played in the sandbox. And we'll grab the um, butterfly screen. OK. So now I can go to the start. And I've already got an application, but it doesn't do much. It's stuck on a particular page. So um, I'm unable to move from page to page if I look at this application. Um, so let's, uh, I'll show you one thing that we can do, which is to add a button. So a button is going to be another sprite. And here down in these, uh, down here in the lower left, we have our sprites. I'm going to create one. I'm going to choose from my library. 
and you have several categories. I'm going to choose from this uh, vector drawn. So bitmap versus vector. The vector graphics just look a lot smoother. So I'm going to select an arrow. And now I've pulled in an arrow on here, and I can move it around on the screen. And in fact, Scratch, he just doesn't have a role in this. So um, I am going to right-click and delete him. He's now gone from my application. And now I need something to happen when I click on, um, on this button. I need it to take me to the next screen. So first of all, I'm going to look at something called events. So if, if an action takes place, um, and this can be something that the, the user does, they click on something, um, that generates an event. So this one right here, when this sprite is clicked, I'm going to move that over. Okay, and when that sprite is clicked, um, I, need a, um, I need it to go to the next background. Well, that affects kind of the look of things, so I'm going to look at looks. And here we see switch backdrop. So I'm going to put switch backdrop on here. Now, I don't want to go to a particular one. I just want, or, uh, I want to go to just the next backdrop. So now I've got a button in my application. And you can be playing with it at any time. You notice now when I click on this arrow, it steps through. And then it wraps around and comes back to the beginning. So I probably want to be able to back up. So I want to add another sprite. So this arrow 2, um, I'm going to give that a name. That'll be forward. And I want another one of those. So I'm just going to duplicate it. But I need this one to be, uh, we'll call it reverse. Okay. So I now have two sprites, forward and reverse. Of course, that reverse doesn't look like it's pointing in the right direction. So I'm going to go over the costumes. And I, uh, I click on my arrow. And um, it gave me some pre-selected directions, so I'll just select that one. In fact, that's all I'm ever going to use, so I'm going to get rid of these others. And the reason for getting rid of them isn't just tidying up, but I want to make sure I don't accidentally change pictures and then get confused. So there's only a, a left arrow here. I can do the same thing on this other one, get rid of the pictures that I don't need. Um, so I'll get rid of that and that and that, and now I've got arrows going in the right direction. Of course, this left arrow that I added, if I click on it, it goes to the next one instead of the previous. So I go back to the scripts tab. And instead of going to next, I go to previous. Now I can go forward. I think I changed the wrong sprite. This should be next. And this should be previous. Okay, now my app is working. So if you're, you know, for a programmer, this, this on the fly changing, nothing ever breaks, um, is just kind of a, a really a, a low stress environment for, for building something because you don't have a, a compile cycle or anything like that. You just make the changes and try it out. And you'll see some other stuff I do that we just change on the fly. And there's some things I can uh, tweak about this, but you can see these scripts just to get it working are pretty simple. You'll notice they didn't give you buttons. They give you sprites, and that's all you've got. You've got a small number of kind of uh, ideas that you need to get your head around. You've got a backdrop, right? So like on a stage, this is a painted screen in the background. And then you've got sprites that can move around. The sprites can interact with each other, detect collisions, and um, they can uh, draw pictures. Um, they can move. So with that comment, remember we had a, uh, a ball bouncing around in there. So I'm going to save this. And um, actually, it's saved on itself uh, by itself. I see that it said save. I'm going to go ahead and share it. So when I share it, if you happen to go to my page, look up P. Benson, you'll see this is now available. You can grab a copy of it for yourself and remix it, make it your own. Um, there is no copywriting going on here. And this, or there's, uh, now this is all you know, freely usable, creative uh, commons licensing. Okay, so I want to create a, uh, a new project. So I'm going to create a ball uh, that's bouncing around on the screen. Well, actually, I'm going to do it right in that other project. So I'm going to go back to uh, looking inside. But I want to add a sprite for a ball. So I'll show you how the drawing editor works to create this one. 
I'm going to uh, convert to vector mode. I'll just draw a little ball here and we'll fill it with a color. Plug in my paint bucket. And now I've got a red ball. And I want the ball to move around on the screen. So remember we looked at the scripting and I can click move. And every time I click move, it moves. So I'm going to put that over here in my script. That's something I need to do. I need it to move. But I want to have it keep doing that. So I can put a loop on it. All right. So this is a control structure. And I could have it just repeat 10 times. And you see it run forward 100 steps. Or I could just have it repeat forever. And now it runs forward, except it crashed into the wall. So I need to fix that. And over in the motion, I see that there's something called, if you're on the edge, bounce. And now the ball is bouncing back and forth. It's not a very interesting motion. Um, and we see it's kind of twitching up and down, too. So I'm going to click on that script again and stop it. Uh, or I could leave it running. So we'll see it change as I fix this. I go to the costume, and you can specify where the center is on the costume. You see it's off center, so I'm going to click on the center. And that fixes it. Now it's it's uh, not twitching like it was. Um, so back to the script. And one other thing that I can do with this, while it's, while it's bouncing, I could also say, well, I want to change the direction. So there are scripts or little blocks here for having it rotate, change its direction. And so now I've got it bouncing at uh, an angle, and it, when it hits an edge, it bounces off the wall. Okay. Um, now, this isn't really the, uh, this is a really simple script. I want it to happen as soon as I come to this uh, page. So I can show you more, but I want to keep moving. But you can have it say, well, only have this, have this sprite disappear unless I'm on a particular backdrop. Um, and so when we, uh, you notice that when we looked at the, the other application, the, the regular picnic app. Um, we'll go back to my page and load the picnic. We'll see that uh, these, the bouncing ball only appeared on one, side, on one page. And you can notice a few other things. That, For example, I had the left arrow disappear when I'm on the first page. So you can add things like that. And if you look over here at the script, there's this, uh, the script says, well, if the backdrop has changed, um, if the backdrop name is at the end, hide the right arrow. If I was to look at the left arrow, when the backdrop name uh, backdrop has changed, um, it'll hide that button if it's on the cover page. So I'll show you more of that as we go through. Um, but uh, what I was mentioning about the ball, I get to this particular screen. If I look at the tennis ball, it's got kind of a complicated thing for its uh, motion because I've added gravity to it. But if you look at it, it's a very simple script. When the backdrop has changed, just keep going. As long as we're um, on the uh, car backdrop, keep moving the ball. As soon as we leave the car backdrop, hide the ball. Um, and so when I click the button and switch, the ball goes away. OK. Um, so I may come back to that and show some more features. But the next feature I want to show you is um, related to this next page, where remember there was a butterfly on here. And um, let's see, where is that butterfly? Yeah, curiously, he's not, uh, not showing up. So we may have to check back on that. Um, but I'm going to show you how the uh, the video motion works. So video motion with the um, with Scratch is a little bit like the Connect on uh, feature that allows us to um, the computer has a uh, most laptops have a video camera built into them, particularly Macs, and um, so it can detect motion. And you might see in the background that I'm showing up. I'm going to click on this set video transparency, I'm going to turn it down to 25%. And now it comes through, and you can see, uh, see me much more clearly. 
Now that may be lagging a bit on your screen. So I'm going to set it back to 75% uh, and I'm going to use that feature to uh, create motion. So let's go to um, taking a look at, uh, let's create a new project and so I'm going to create And now for uh, for video motion, oops, uh, one moment I have to log in here on another machine. See my script. Okay, so for video motion, what I'm going to do is I'm creating a new window here and a new app, and I want to add a button. So I'm going to uh, sprite. Now I can import these or I can draw them. So I'll show you how you can just hand draw a sprite or hand draw a, a button in this case. So I'm going to use vector mode. I'll drag out a, uh, a rectangle. And you can change those too. If you want to make them look a little more funky, you can add points to them and um, or take points away. And this is going to allow me to kind of stretch around and create funny shaped buttons if I want something that looks more hand drawn. And that's one thing you'll notice about uh, just kind of the culture around Scratch is these aren't supposed to be necessarily super polished looking applications. Um, I'll put a label on the inside um, and we'll start actually, I'm going to try changing the size of something. And I'm going to fill that with a color. And so there's a, a hand created button in here. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to have it change size based on uh, the video. So I'm going to go to scripts, I'm going to look at sensing, and um, I can ask for is there any video motion on this sprite? And again, it's asking me do I want to, uh, to allow the camera to be be used. And so now you can see, uh, see me in the background. I'm going to get rid of uh, the, the cat again. And I've got this uh, button in the upper left for showing size. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to look for an event to see well if, what's going on. Is there uh, it's listening on the microphone. Is there a change in the loudness level? Is there some video motion? And the video motion, if I'm moving rapidly, there will be a, a high value of video motion. If I'm sitting very still, there will be very low value video motion. So I'm going to just leave it uh, at 10. But what I want to have it do is change the size of the button anytime I touch it. So in the uh, looks, there's a ability to change size. And I'm going to just change size by uh, by minus one. Okay. And now I'm going to go up and touch that. And you see it's kind of laggy possibly, but when I touch the button, the button shrinks in size. And so you can kind of imagine in a classroom setting how uh, you know the students could build things that they can interact with. The number of things that you can do this, you can change size, you can rotate, you can stretch, you can do all kinds of visual effects. You can make things disappear or reappear. Um, you can cause them to move around like I do with a butterfly. So there are all kinds of things like that. I probably want some kind of button to set it back to where it was before it disappears. You know, every time I touch it, it keeps getting smaller. It's pretty <laughs> tiny now. So I'm going to have to add a, um, I'm going to add a button. So I'm going to import just a, a canned button. And I think there's one in here. I'll use this one. So that's going to be my reset button. I'm going to go modify that. Let's put in um, some text, reset. And now that reset button is going to need a script. So what happens when I reset? Well, um, what I think I'll have it do is it's going to, I'm going to do something here where I communicate with the other button. So again, this is an event. If I clicked on it, when I click on this sprite, 
I want it to tell that other sprite to fix itself. So I'm just going to broadcast a message. I'll make up a message. And again, this is getting into features that this is a very object-oriented feature, the concept of sending messages to other objects. Um, so just uh, I find it really exciting that you can communicate this to, uh, to kids. So uh, the message will be just reset. And Kristen, how's the uh, video working in there? It's good. We can. Uh, okay. It's definitely rendering slowly, but it okay. looks good. So what I want to do is um, I'm, all I've said is when I click this, I'm going to send out a reset message. So our size button or sprite needs to be listening for that. So when I look at size, I see that um, it's got something that reacts to uh, you know when video motion changes. But I also want to do something when I receive a reset message. So here, when I receive reset, I'm going to drag this out here. What do I want to do? Well, I want to change my size back. That's something about how I look. So I'm going to look in the looks category and set size. Now right now it's at 7.9%. I have it resized to 100. Set that button out. Okay, set it back. I can put my finger up there and move it around, and it shrinks down. And again, I could uh, I could show you a lot of features, and near the end when we have time for questions, if you want to see some other things, I can uh, add some other buttons and show uh, other effects. But I want to show you next how we can do some turtle graphics, and so this is really going back to the roots. The um, Seymour paper, when he was um, there, was actually a physical programmable turtle that uh, could draw pictures on paper on the ground. Um, so I'm going to do something akin to that. I'm going to create a new uh, new project. Just throw away this one, and um, I'm going to call this one Turtle 4T2013. And I'll I'll share this uh, when it's done. So the first thing is I need to get a turtle, and again I'm going to just go import one. So I'm going to I have to have one that I put on the disk. That I like so. There's turtle, and I gave him a tail. That looks like my guy. So there he is. Um, I don't need the kitties anymore, so they're gone, and I'm left with uh, with turtle. He's pretty huge, and I want him drawing pictures. So I really need to uh, to shrink that down. So one of the first things I'll do is. Um, and as soon as he starts, so a kind of base thing in the script would be to change his look and change his size. So we've already played around with setting size. I'm going to just set his size to 20%. And now he's, uh, he's good to go. Um, now, so we've talked about motion. And uh, so I can click this move 10 steps and he moves. What I want to show you now is how we can have him draw. So I'm going to look at the, the pen feature. And this is really, these are the kinds of things that were available in uh, Logo. And today I was looking on the web, there are like 200 versions almost of Logo out there in various forms. Um, so I put a pen down, and then when I, oh, I want that motion script so I can move them around. When I move, okay, let's see, pen down. Hmm. I'm not getting any color, so let's take a look at what color that is. We'll set the pen color to this. Make sure the pen's down. Uh, let's see, what else might I be overlooking? Pen size, five. Okay. This screen shrunk down, so it was making the pen so small, so skinny, it wasn't showing up. So, in fact, I'll make that uh, pen size 10. And now we can see it's creating a fatter line. In fact, this, there might be some lag here. I'll go back to 5. OK. But every time I click 10, he moves. But he's only moving in a straight line. Oh, I know what's happening. His markings are underneath him. So this is another example of I want to be sure I set where his, his center is. Now, if I shrink this down and I look at this guy, um, the center of the drawing is in the middle of the turtle. I want it to be at the tip of his tail. So he's going to draw with the tip of his tail. Okay. 
Now if I move them here, go to my script, move them 10 steps, yeah, that's still pretty far or pretty fat. Let's do three. Okay, that's a nice size. Okay, now I want to have them do some fancier stuff. I also want to clear the screen and it's getting dirty, so I'm going to put a little clear button out here. I can click on that, uh, or they call those blocks, so a clear block. And so after he's moved 10 steps, I'd like to have him draw a square. So I need to have him change direction. So I can have him turn. And if I'm drawing a square, I'll have to turn 90 degrees. So let's clear and try that again. And let's have it to make it easier to see. Let's try 50 steps. So he moved 50 steps and turned right. Moves 50 steps. Every time I click this, we see him move 50 steps and turn right. Now it'd be nice if I could put all those together and not have to click it. So I'm going to go back to one of the control structures. I can repeat something a certain number of times. So I drag it out here and wrap it around and it just drops um, around that. So now I can repeat four times. Um, when I click that, you see him whip around and he draws a square. Okay. Whip around and draw a square. And pretty frequently after I've played around with this, I probably want to put him back to the center of the screen, clear the screen off. Um, so I'm going to add a home button for that. And uh, so I'm going to import that. I have to have something from my library. Buttons. There's a home button. Open that up. That's a little big. Looks. Let's set that size to 15%. Uh, Okay, I've got a little home button I can use in here, and I'll add an event. When this sprite is clicked, I want to clear the screen. And um, I'm going to send out a reset message again, or a go home message, so the turtle will hear the go home message. So I'm going to broadcast new message, go home. And the turtle needs to react to that. So when I receive a go home as the turtle, what am I going to do? Well, I want to go to this location where I am right now. So I'm going to go to where I am right now. And then um, I also want to, let's see, what else should I do? I probably want to be pointing in the same direction every time. So I'm going to have him point 90 degrees. And now I can draw some pictures. Let's draw another square or two. And if I want to go home, I'm going to click on the home button. Hmm. Took me right back home, but it left a mark on the screen. So what I might want to do is, well, let's lift the pen up before we go back. And so the pen goes up. And then when I get back home, I probably put, want to put the pen down. Okay, so now I'll move it somewhere, hit home, and it goes back. All right. Um, there's some other fun things you can do with this. So in terms of applying this to curriculum, um, getting uh, students to understand, well, that's how you draw a square. You, each side is the same length. You, uh, you go the length of the side of the square, then you turn 90 degrees, and you repeat this four times. That draws a square up. You could also show that um, you know if you're teaching how many uh, about the circle and how there are 360 degrees around the circle, uh, we can duplicate that. So I uh, right click and, and I've got a duplicated block. Let's just do three times. We're going to make a triangle, but then we need to turn 120 degrees. And so now when I click that, I've drawn a triangle. Now you can start doing some pretty fun things with this. Um, you can get rid of these extra scripts, by the way, uh, by dragging them off to the, into this area and letting go, and it disappears. But an interesting thing you could do, for example, with, um, oh, let's say with this triangle. So I'm going to go back home, and when I draw that, it would be interesting if I then turned maybe 30 degrees and drew it again, and turned 30 degrees and uh, did it again. And so you can see how, well, repeating this pattern, I can do kind of a spirograph-like thing. If I was going to turn 30 degrees, it would take me 12 times to go around the circle. So I'm going to add another loop. I'm going to repeat 12 times. 
and within for each of those 12 times, I'm going to repeat three times. I'm going to move 50 steps, turn 120 degrees. Of course, that's just going to do the same thing all over, over and over again. I need to add a step in here where I, after I'm done drawing that triangle, I'm going to do a 30 degree turn. And notice how the turtle's been left in this funny state, but when I click my home button, it puts it right back where it should be. And I click this block to run it, and he draws a cool little picture. And um, so, and anywhere I position him, if I repeat it, he'll draw it again. So this gives an opportunity for kids to explore a lot of uh, <clears throat> geometrical ideas and, um, and get a sense of how things are drawn, uh, how they can create uh, different images, and there's there's a ton you can do with this, uh, with turtle graphics. And like I said, that was kind of one of the uh, the founding ideas in all of this. So now the next um, the next slide I want to take you to. So let's go back to um, uh, the slides, and um, so. By now, we have advanced to uh, we looked at the drawing editor. We saw the tennis ball bouncing. OK, well, I'll hop right back. Do I need to turn it off? I can still see your app. OK. So I'll leave the, the app showing on. But if you look at the script editor, this looks kind of overwhelming. But we've been, been going through this. And we've already explored over half of these categories. Now, we haven't fully explored them. There are a lot of features left. Like I mentioned, I'm going to skip over sound. If you get in and play around with Scratch, that's the first thing they show you is how to create, um, get your cat to do some dancing on the screen and play sounds. Um, there's a huge variety of uh, digitized sounds that you can work with. So um, the next thing I want to go to is a lab that really, I think it's you could use it as early as fifth grade, and uh, we used it as well with our AP Calc students. So it's, I think, kind of an, uh, an interesting way to um, come up with an app that, that has broad applicability. So I'm going to save this. Uh, and then I'm going to go to, so you can, you can uh, play around now with Turtle 4T213. Uh, well, I have to share it. It's now shared. So I should point out that it's one click sharing. When you're done, you want other people to see it, click share, and it's out there. Um, you can add instructions, um, click the home button to reset the turtle. Um, click the see inside button and play around with the turtle's motion scripts. This, we didn't really create an application that, that does anything by itself. There are no buttons on there that control it beyond returning it to home. But you can get into the development environment, you know, and, and um, move the move them around and uh, draw pictures from inside the development environment. Okay. So the other thing that I want to show you then, there, this other project is this um, at the races, and that is right here. We use this to demonstrate uniform motion. So I'll just start with a demo of it. Yeah, so are uh, people screens staying updated? Looks like Kristen's is starting to, uh, is frozen. OK. Yeah, comment on. Um, I mean, one thing I'd love to see is just uh, glancing now at some of the chat conversations. But um, you know, I would love to be able to interact with folks. And uh, I know this can kind of be daunting to get started. Although, like I say, I think it's it's about as friendly as it gets. But I uh, would love to help people get started. If you have questions about it, and you know, my email uh, link is at the end, and you can reach me through my website as well. So I'm uh, very excited to to work with others to figure out what we could do to, to build some interesting curriculum. So this, uh, this one is called Uniform Motion, this app that I'm showing you. And it's one I created, uh, like I say, for, well, I use it with my algebra students who are actually repeating algebra um, all the way to the AP Calc students. But I really think, based on I'm uh, a fifth grader, and uh, some of the stuff that I've seen her doing, like plotting points and getting to understand t-charts, 
uh, that they're starting to introduce as early as fifth grade, um, those are things that uh, you can give them a something experiential, a real phenomenon that they can look at and uh, and get what they're doing. So you have six or seven buttons across the top here. And if I click on the green button, it sets me up with uh, this whole car. You notice the, the graphics here look a little uh, aliased. I actually created this with the previous version of Scratch. And then, as I mentioned earlier, everything got updated to 2.0. It was a super smooth transition. Um, Every application that I built got ported automatically. I didn't have to do anything. It now runs faster and smoother, but they couldn't do anything about my jagged graphics. So I might spit it up later. But uh, this shows me the um, this green car. When I press the space bar, so I'm pressing the space bar now, the car starts to move. And you can see a timer uh, in the upper left. It's showing how many seconds have elapsed. So this car took two seconds to go 10 yards. And so the students can build a T-chart and say, okay, I see where the car was at a given time, and um, then I can graph those on a XY coordinate plane and um, gather some data, and they see how the slope of the line uh, is constant. And then we have them go through and they look at some other cars. Well, let's look at the red car. How is it different? And it's pretty apparent that it's running a lot faster than the green car. You're not seeing the car. You might try to refresh it. Okay. Let me check the. Um, no, we're stuck. Here we go. Oh, sweet. Okay. Okay, so the green car, we hit the space bar, it moves. Uh, actually, what we see is the slide. So we need to re share the app, I think. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. The advantages of being in the same room with your moderator. Okay, so green. I click on that. You can see it moving. And at two seconds, it's at the 10-yard line. And fun thing with this in the class, I mean, it's uh, it's not always easy, especially as we get into uh, May, engaging the students. We just did this project with uh, my algebra class. And uh, they started predicting, you know, what time it would be, uh, how many seconds would elapse when it reached the 30-yard line. And uh, so it was an unusual level of engagement for them, especially given the, uh, the weather outside. So I'll reset. I, I gather this data on all the cars. Now I can look at races. And now you see, for example, I've got a race, green versus red. The green car, it gets a big head start because it's a lot slower. And uh, so this has applications, like I said, for fifth graders, middle schoolers getting up in, uh, towards algebra are signs look, well, what's, I've graphed this. I see that it's, it, the, the data creates a line. I've got two different slopes for the line. I have two different intercepts. When I went back to the start and did green versus red, the red car at time zero is at yard zero. But the green car at time zero is at 60. So if I'm putting time on the horizontal axis, I've got a y-intercept of 60. So you can, uh, again, You've got some experience, uh, something concrete that they can look at uh, to contextualize all this stuff. And um, so I mentioned that you could use this throughout the curriculum. So as you get up towards physics, for example, physics, we studied kinematics. And you need to understand position versus time, velocity at a given time. You learn that velocity is actually the slope of that graph. and if I want to find the position at a given time, I actually need to find the area under the velocity graph. So that starts edging towards calculus, and we use this to introduce uh, kinematics to the calculus class as well. And I added, for example, there's another app I could show you, but it's got a car that has uniform acceleration. And uh, so again, fifth grade through twelfth grade, I think there are applications for this kind of this kind of app. Yeah, um, there's a question about uh, do the cat's legs move? So um, let's see if we can uh, let's create a, a new app. It'll throw uh, Scratch the Cat up there for us, and let's see if we can get his legs to move. So how would we do that? What we notice is there are multiple costumes, and I haven't really spoken enough about that probably. You can have any number of costumes, and I could show you a, a much more complicated one, but you can see that 
scratch his legs, and he's walking or he's running, it's, it's kind of like a stride. So I could have him every time he moves, for example, let's have him move 10 steps. But when he moves, I also want him to switch to the other position, and then we can go back and forth. So let's, that's a look, which means it's related to his costume. We're just going to go to the next costume. I click, and you see he moves. Every time I click, he's moving. Let's put that in a loop, and we'll repeat it 10 times. I'll reposition him over here, and we see him run across the screen. And that's one of the cool things about this is, um, you know, somebody asks a question, there's a lot of times it's like, yeah, there's a pretty easy way to do that. That's a, a loop with two steps in it. I um, had another question about how do you scaffold Scratch skill acquisition. Um, I think the way to do it is maybe akin to how I've been going through this. Pick out something really simple. The first skill acquisition might be, um, well, let's, uh, you guys have been drawing pictures in here. Let's take those pictures, and it's hard to draw on the computer, but um, I'm going to take a picture of them with my iPhone, and you can upload those pictures. Now you've got your pictures as backgrounds. And then let's look at how we bounce a ball. And you start with just moving the ball. And so it's um, one of the things, the kids will, will start exploring this pretty quickly. Um, and uh, so but I think overall that's a great question. I haven't given a lot of thought. I have to say every application, I've every, the only way I've used Scratch so far in the classroom is something I've built to basically take the place of some kind of lab and experience. And that was a really valuable, what really inspired me was we did a physics lab and the students had so much trouble gathering the data that they got very frustrated. Um, it wasn't repeatable. They graphed it and it, they didn't get a line because they had trouble operating the timers and knowing what they were supposed to record. But the beauty of doing it on the computer is, is perfectly repeatable. And all the data across the class was the same. And yes, that's not a realistic lab environment, but when you're trying to teach kinematics for the first time, you don't want to simultaneously be teaching uh, good lab procedures. You know, that can come later. So same kind of thing here, I think, is um, in uh, developing the skills. You want to you know, start out small and give them something that's repeatable and they can all do the same thing. And remember, you're going to have your own library of projects. So you can just, when I have the students go do a lab, I give them a URL to go to and um, they're all going to the same starting point. So you could say, let's go look at how to make a ball bounce, go to my ball, bouncing ball demo. And they'll look at the script and I'll be looking at the same thing. Um, let me show you, I'm going to kind of run out of time here, so I want to show you just real quickly some of the other uh, projects that I've got. Um, just give you an idea. Another thing that we did, um, there's a math text that I just really like. It wasn't the text that we used in class. Um, but it's, uh, it's based on uh, Harold Jacobs, um, what I'm going to show you is based on Harold Jacobs' book, Mathematics, a Human Endeavor. There's links to this information on the website. Um, looking for, oh, there it is. So this is um, uh, a game of billiards. And on an adjustable pool table, this one is four feet long and three feet high, and when I hit the ball, it bounces from this corner at a 45 degree angle. And then it bounces off the walls, and it keeps going until it hits a corner. Okay, and so there's some interesting things, you know, I'm not going to go through what uh, what Jacobs did with this, but there, this is a great opportunity for students to go looking for patterns. They can change the size of the table. You know, I start this off with, I give them some handouts where they draw them by hand and uh, get accustomed to thinking about how this works. But um, there's kind of a fun one here is if I start off with a, uh, let's say, a one by three table and I hit the ball, it'll count how many times it bounces before it stops. And so in a one by three table, it bounced three times. A two by three table, it bounces one, two, three, four times. Okay, how about a three by three table? So they're ready to say, well, it's going to bounce one more time, but it actually goes straight across the opposite corner and stops. 
So there's a whole bunch of interesting patterns that they can work with here. And again, this gives them the repeatability. One thing I discovered in the classroom was the students drawing the pictures on the paper, they would have trouble drawing them accurately and they'd get, uh, they'd bounce too many times or just take a shortcut straight across to the other corner. And uh, this gives them, again, that repeatability and an experience. Um, I've got uh, another example I'll show you. We've shown you some motion examples, so I'm going to jump to one that I've done. I haven't used it in the classroom yet, um, but this is something that could be used in uh, probably like a pre-calc class or a uh, calculus class. It's got differential equations, things like that, but it could also be used just explaining how radioactivity works. So again, I'm going to go to my, my stuff. And there's There we go. So this is called uh, radioactive. And again, I did this one in a, an old development environment. Um, I'll blow it up to full screen. Oh, actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to go in and see the inside. So here's this application that um, if I click on the, the large red dot, it puts up 200 atoms. And this is simulating um, you've got 200 carbon-14 atoms. And this is exactly something, something you cannot do in the classroom because carbon-14 has a half-life of like 6,000 years. Um, so you could observe it one day and say, well, let's observe it next week and see how much the radioactivity has dropped. Um, first of all, you just probably aren't going to be playing around with this stuff. Um, but I'm going to press the space bar and it starts decaying. And so that may have only seemed like a second to you, but we can see right here that 800 years just went by. Okay. And every time I press the space bar, I get a count of how much is left. Okay. This follows, you know, that um, the students can graph it. It fits an exponential decay process. That's definitely something that they would learn about in uh, Algebra 2 up through calculus. Um, and could also be used in a, as a demonstration, maybe some analysis in a physical science course. Uh, one of the things that was really cool that they uh, introduced in uh, 2.0, Scratch 2.0, is they had a turbo mode. So if I run this with 2,000 atoms and I hold the space bar down for a while, I just let go of the space bar and it keeps running because it got behind. There was just too much for Scratch to do there. And so it's playing catch up right now. In the turbo mode, it'll keep up. So I'm going to switch this to turbo mode. And uh, so that's the other great thing. This thing's running in a browser, but it's actually really fast. I'll do a quick reset on it. And um, so after, uh, we'll let it go out to about 5,800 years. Okay, there we are. That's a half-life. So we see that there are 2,000 atoms, 988 of them have decayed. So there's a demonstration you can give of how this works. Um, I think I'm going to show you uh, one, more, uh, one more demonstration here. and show you the script for it. And this is, I'm going to skip ahead to a vehicle on the track. Okay, this vehicle on a track. Let's, uh, let's just go ahead and see inside. And given probably five minutes, I could build this for you. Um, but we can see the script right here. This has two sprites, a little car right here and an orange cone. And I needed something to keep it from running off the screen, so I put an orange cone out there and it stops when it hits the cone. So what does the car have? It's got a costume. The costume is just a box with a couple of black wheels in the back. And then I made the front uh, wheels. One is green, one is red. And these are going to act like sensors for me. I'm going to walk you through what the script does. So when I click the green flag, this will start running. It resets, it goes to a starting position and it points the car in the, direct, the 90 degree direction. So it'll be going straight across the screen left to right. And then it puts it into an infinite loop. And it asks, if I'm touching the orange cone, then just stop this script. So that'll, that'll kick it out if it runs into the orange cone. Then it asks, if the color green is touching the color black, then turn counterclockwise 15 degrees. So anytime this 
this green wheel touches the black, it's going to turn away from it. And conversely, if the red color touches, it's going to turn clockwise, so it's going to turn away from it. So we have something effectively, it's, it's like it's running on a rail. And so this is something that, you, you know, physically you could create something like this, but here you're um, effectively creating a little robot on the screen. And then after it's made its little steering correction, it moves forward five steps and it tries it again. So we'll hit the start, and we see it run around. So I did nothing to really tell this thing how to run. We could, in fact, create a new backdrop. So I'm going to go over to the backdrop, and um, well, it looks like I already have one in there. It's a different one. Let me just create another new one. Um, so new backdrop, I'm going to draw. I need a pen tool. Probably needs to be a little fatter. About that fat. And oh, that's too sharp a turn. So we'll probably say go off the track. That's all right. We're not afraid to have a problem here. So if I hit the start button, I'm going to move my cone over if it manages to make it that far, and hit the start. Okay, right off the bat there's a problem because it's going to the wrong starting position. So I'm going to go to my script. I'm going to just get rid of that um, part that says go to that particular point. I'll position it where it's supposed to be. So I've put it where it's supposed to be. When I click the green button, it'll point 90, degree, 90 degrees and, and, and go. Yep, and it managed to make it uh, pass that glitch in the road. So what I kind of wanted to highlight here is you might feel like as a brand new user, well, I couldn't come up with that script. Yeah, but there's, um, there are some apps out there. There are 3 million uh, plus Scratch applications that have been shared out on the web, and um, there are uh, probably thousands of uh, Scratch users that if you had a question, how can I get a robot car to work? They'd love to answer you, um, myself included. So you can get one of these things, then modify it, and uh, to to fit your purposes. Um, we've only got a couple minutes, so are there any questions? Yeah, and Kristen's commented on um, time for the students to create stuff. I'm absolutely interested in that. Um, I mean, I'm just finished up my, uh, or I'm finishing up my internship. Uh, would love to find opportunities teaching computer science. And I picked up an, uh, I'm getting an endorsement in computer science, but knowing that there are not a lot of opportunities out there through a regular computer science teacher. Um, but I think you can certainly find people that are interested in uh, working on that problem. A lot of those people probably are, um, maybe they're involved in a robotics program. Um, but, uh, by all means, I'd love to, to work with people on building curriculum around it. Don't see anybody else. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you all for coming. And uh, there's uh, the last page of my, um, you can see there's a, uh, a link to my website, and that's got uh, a lot of the information that you just saw. Thank you very much, folks. Remember, you can go back to the conference website and take a look at what other sessions are being offered today and in the coming days. And spread the word to your colleagues that this session will be archived if you want to take another look back at it. Thanks for joining us. Have a good day.